Good Tuesday morning. Thank you kindly for joining us on the Jerry and Jerry Show. It's great to be with you. We are in downtown Charlottesville, Virginia, less than two miles away from the John Paul Jones Arena, Scott Stadium, and Thomas Jefferson's University. We have breaking news this morning on the Jerry and Jerry Show with Ryan Dunn surprising some of Wahoo Nation by declaring for the NBA draft. Mr. Dunn, a projected first round draft pick. His offensive production needs some work, but that seven foot two wingspan, that athletic ability, that leaping ability has Ryan Dunn entering the NBA draft. We'll talk Ryan Dunn with Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer on the Jerry and Jerry Show, right after an interview with Will Driscoll, the executive director of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. Judah Wickhauer is the director and producer. If you can go to the studio camera, welcome the star of our show, Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe, and then weave Will Driscoll into the mix. Hootie, quite a guest we have on Skype this morning. Uh, it's a, a joy for me to welcome Will. Uh, he's been the ex he's the executive director of the, of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, uh, and uh, every time I see him. Uh, I know I light up with a smile because he's such a positive uh, guy and he, he does such great work for the Hall of Fame and uh, he's really made a difference in that organization. He, he's trying to spread it um, all over the state. Uh, I, you know, there was a feeling uh, for years that it was just located and, and focused more, I guess, on the Tidewater area of the state. And Will has done a, a great job in including, making it a very inclusive uh, organization for the entire state of Virginia. And it's something to be really proud of. It, uh, he is a hardworking guy and driven, man. I, I tell you, I've, I've, I've known him for um, uh, more than a year. And uh, every time I'm around him, I just feel energized about... Uh, with his positivity and his his drive, and um, Will, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Jerry, and I'll have to have to bring you on as my PR person. <laughs> I, I love that intro. <laughs> thank you so well, you're, much. You're, Happy to be it's here. More than deserved, and um, I think anybody that's had contact with you would confirm that uh, analysis. And uh, I know this is a special week for you. Um, the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame will have its, I guess, its 51st class this coming Saturday in Henrico. I'll get you to give us the details in a moment. And uh, it, it's a fun-filled weekend. I, I was part of the festivities last year. I was so fortunate and blessed. Um, and, and uh, gosh, what a, what a great weekend it is for anybody involved. I, I was treated like a king, as were the other inductees. And... Uh, it's a moment in my life that I'll never forget. It was uh, definitely the highlight of my career and um, such a blessing. And, and uh, Will is right in the middle of it. Just tell us, Will, a little bit about this weekend's festivities. And, and if, for, if anyone is interested, I, you may be sold out. I'm not sure. Well, so the, the one benefit to moving it this year, so for those who don't know, this is actually the first time we'll be hosting the annual induction events outside of Hampton Roads. Uh, our home is still in Hampton Roads. We love our home here in Hampton Roads. It's where we've been based for over 50 years. But to your point, as you mentioned earlier, we've been very focused on expanding our reach, expanding our visibility, expanding awareness, uh, increasing engagement and outreach. And so this year's 2024 induction events will be hosted in Henrico County at the new Henrico Sports and Events Center uh, that opened back in December. And so because of that, we don't have space limitations. Now, you know, we, we, we're not at a 2,000 person event. We're not a 1,000 person event, but we, we're not sold out yet. Although tickets do, ticket sales will stop tomorrow because at some point our staff does have to get up to Henrico <laughs> County from Virginia Beach. So we're going to stop our sales tomorrow, but we've been over the moon with how it's with the response that we've received from not just the central Virginia community, but really the, the Virginia sports community. Um, our class this year touches all corners of the state. And so we're seeing a lot of people that maybe haven't engaged with us in the past from the Northern Virginia uh, area, from out in Southwest central Virginia, out where you all are, um, that are going to be coming to this event because of their connections to the inductees. And 
it's just a really exciting time. It's very busy. Um, you know, it's very, it can be stressful sometimes when you're planning events, but you know, th this event is not about me. It's not about the hall. It's about the nine inductees that we have going in. And, and we're just really thrilled uh, to be able to welcome them, their families, and their supporters to Henrico County this Saturday. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are two events. We have our Breakfast with Champions, which is a very fun kind of casual event. And then we have our reception and ceremony that evening, which is a bit more of the pomp and circumstance. Both events are open to the public. Tickets continue to be on sale through tomorrow, uh, vasportshof.com. And they, they both provide different models of engagement for the sports fans. So you're not you're not forced to sit through the 10 speeches if that's not what you want to do. If you want to come and meet the inductees and engage with them in a Q&A, that's the breakfast event. But uh, we're just really excited about it. And, uh, and like I said, for it being our first time in Central Virginia, the response we've seen has been very, very positive. And, and it justifies our, our decision to, to, to bring it to Central Virginia. And who knows what, what that might open up in the future as far as possibilities go. Yeah, and... Uh as far as uh, the Charlottesville area, the University of Virginia is well represented in this, in this class with former athletic director Craig Littlepage uh, will be one of the inductees. Also, Chris Long, the former All-American defensive end and NFL All-Pro who uh, resides here in Charlottesville, as does Mr. Littlepage, who we had on the show a few weeks ago. And uh, Monica Wright, uh, the great women's basketball player for Debbie Ryan's program back in the day, are, are the three local representatives going in. Tell us, Will, about uh, the other six inductees that will be going in this weekend. Well, you, you mentioned the three UVA connections, and there's actually one more that Craig actually brought to my attention, and that's Jill Ellis. So Jill Ellis, before she became a head coach at the collegiate level and obviously went on to win two Women's World Cups with the U.S. Women's National Team, uh, she was an assistant coach at UVA. Oh, yeah, so, right. so there's another UVA connection there for you. Uh, but yeah, so Jill Ellis, she's from Northern Virginia, played soccer collegiately at William & Mary and then went on to great success with the U.S. Women's National Team. Uh, our Distinguished Virginian Award recipient this year, which is kind of our Sports and Philanthropy and Community Award, uh, is going to go to Rick Jeffrey, who ran the Special Olympics Virginia for 22 years. And the impact he had, not just in the Richmond region where Special Olympics Virginia is based, but really across the state, uh, it can't be measured. Uh, they supported 22,000 athletes annually, created so much access and opportunity to sports for people that probably had been overlooked prior to that. So his, his impact is immeasurable. Uh, you then have LaShawn Merritt, one of our great Olympic champions from Virginia. He's from, the Ports he's from Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, Three-time Olympic gold medalist, four overall Olympic medals, uh, 23 total medals in international competitions at the 400 and 4 by 400 meter relay, and 19 of those. Wow. LaShawn is definitely – yeah, exactly. That, that was the number that, that blew me away, too, is that when he competed, he typically won. <laughs> he did. <laughs> We then have Hal Nunley, a longtime, longtime head men's basketball coach at Randolph-Macon. And the Randolph-Macon basketball program, it, that's one that when you go back through the history books, you see that is a dominant program. They went from Coach Paul Webb, who was an inductee, to Coach Nunley, who's, not, who's going to be an inductee. Uh, Mike Rhodes followed him, and now they've had even more success following Coach Mike Rhodes. So the Randolph-Macon basketball program is, is definitely not just a powerhouse here in Virginia, but a powerhouse nationally. Uh, coach Nunley won 431 games, 24 seasons, five-time conference coach of the year, so definitely well-deserved. And what's been truly unique about Coach Nunley is this is a posthumous honor for him. So he passed away in 2004, but there's going to be over 100 former players in attendance for Coach Nunley's induction this weekend, which to me, that just shows you how special it is to how special this recognition is to just the whole yellow jacket community uh, we then have two media members that are going in this year the first is dave smith longtime uh sports information director for virginia tech uh, you know we can set the rivalry aside you know dave smith is <laughs> is about as well respected as they come in the sports information world and, and truly well deserving of this honor and then paul woody uh paul woody 40 years with uh, the Richmond News Leader, Richmond Times Dispatch, won Virginia Press Association Awards, Pro Football Writers Association Awards, uh, covered any and everything in sports, as as you did, Jerry, as you've done for much of your career. 
And, and Paul definitely has the respect of pretty much everybody he's come in contact with. So it's, it's just a class that really is unique and touches, as I mentioned, all corners of the state. We have Hampton Roads, we have Northern Virginia, we have Central Virginia, we have Southwest. And, and it's just great to see all of these people coming to our events to celebrate the, the sports history that we have in Virginia. And so we're very excited about it. The class is very excited and uh, I can't wait till Saturday. Yeah, I'm excited for Paul Woody, a longtime colleague of mine, and uh, we worked for the same company, so to speak, for uh, a long time. And he, uh, media general, media general, he's a terrific guy and uh, uh, very deserving. And I grew up in the business with Dave Smith. In fact, his mentor at Virginia Tech, kind of when I was a pup in the business, kind of took me under his wing and uh, taught me the ropes to some degree, uh, a guy named Wendy Wisen, uh, who's long gone, but uh, uh, so Dave uh, Dave and I have been friends for uh, decades and uh, so happy for him as well. No question about it. Uh, questions coming in for you here, Will. Let's throw this to you. We wanna, we'd love to get a uh, some behind the scenes stories for you. How about the star of our show, Hootie Ratcliffe? Let's talk about last year. A lot of people don't realize this. Hootie was, you were sick as a dog during the Hall of Fame last year. <laughs> I was. Uh, talk to us about uh, what went into the 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 experience and the uh, the honor and 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 the selection process of the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer sitting across mm. from me. Well, uh, I'll never forget the phone call I got from Will that told me that I had uh, been elected, and um, uh, I was completely speechless, which, if you know me, that's really hard to do, but I, I was blown away, and uh, a moment I'll never forget, and um, yeah, I, I, had, uh, I had a medical problem that I wasn't aware of uh, leading up to the event, and I was having a hard time breathing, actually, and didn't realize that I had some uh, some fluid on my lungs, and um, so I was struggling that entire weekend. To even I didn't have much energy. I, I remember my girlfriend and I walked from the hotel down to the uh, place they have the exhibit near the uh, induction, uh, near the uh, site of the induction, and where they had an exhibit of some of your, um, uh, I guess, some of the things you've accomplished in your career. And uh, I, I walked over there and walked back with her and, and uh, my daughter and my some of my grandchildren. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can make this. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we got back and uh, I, uh, I manned up and um, we uh, uh, went to the uh, ceremony and it was a fantastic uh uh, I, I delivered my speech. I, I, I didn't win my bet. I did break down emotionally a little bit <laughs> at a couple of moments, which I didn't feel so bad when Ryan Zimmerman did the same thing after me, so I, I felt pretty good about that. But um, it was great uh, having so many friends and family there and uh, Jeff Motley, a dear friend and like a brother to me who's vice president of Las Vegas Speedway flew in for the event, and uh, it's great to see him. And it's just a glorious weekend. Uh, so well attended and appreciative crowds. Uh, very interactive crowds for the. Uh, you have a, a little uh, uh, situation, a, a little uh, reception there before the event, uh, where people can mingle with the inductees and past inductees. Uh, the breakfast is great. You, people get to ask some questions to the uh, to the, all the uh, inductees, and uh, it's just a uh, it meant the world to me. It was just sort of the highlight of, of my career. It just made me feel like that I had uh, all those years of deadlines and uh, driving endless hours <laughs> into the night and uh, stuff like that was uh, was well worth it. So. Uh, it, it was a weekend I'll never forget, and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone uh, who went in with me along with uh, uh, we had a great class, including Jimmy Laycock and uh, Sean Moore and Ryan Zimmerman and, and many others. So it was just uh, unforgettable. I'll throw this to you, Will. 
uh, weave us through yeah. weave us through the uh, process of um, selecting media and sports information directors for say like athletes and and coaches who have you know tangible production on a hardwood a soccer pitch a gridiron for say media and sports information directors where perhaps there's not as much um, you know hardware to go by yeah, that, that's a great question. And I will, you know, the, the decision was made well before my time with the hall. So I've been with the hall now for seven years, been in this role for five. And I believe the decision to start including media was made in the mid 90s. And, and it's an important one. Uh, not, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a former uh, broadcaster myself uh, in some small markets, uh, nowhere near here. But, but media is a is a huge component to sports. And so how we go through the selection process is even with the athletes, coaches, and and others, uh, we have categories that we kind of that we kind of sort the nominations through. So the media members are going up against other media nominations. Uh, same with sports information; they're 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 in that media bucket. We then have our professional athletes, but that's really focused on athletes that are from Virginia or born in Virginia, have strong connections to Virginia. Uh, that go on to professional success, but that's kind of more focused on the the big sports, so football, basketball, baseball. We then have another one for the international sports, the Olympic sports, because comparing comparing somebody's career on the track or in the pool or gymnastics is not the same as NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball. Uh, we then have a collegiate category because one of the things that's very important to us at, at the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame are the colleges and universities. You know, we don't have those top level professional sports. We have great professional uh, franchises at the, at the minor league levels, but we don't have the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball. So the colleges and universities, all 37 NCAA sanctioned programs, Division One, Two, II, and Three, they need to know that we see the great athletes and coaches that have come from, from those schools. Uh, and then we have our veterans committee, which is anyone over the age of, of 55. So we have all of these buckets uh, that our honors court can pull from. So we have our screening committee, which reviews all open nominations, which we have over 100 right now. And then they pass on the 30 to 40 best that they deem that year the best to the honors court committee, which is made up of past inductees, sports professionals in Virginia, uh, board members of the Hall of Fame. And we meet the first weekend in November to to select the class. And so we're all going, we're, we're reviewing all of these nominations. And there can be a lot of debate, a lot of discussion um, but uh, I'm always very pleased with how we get through the meeting and we come out with the class that we do uh, because it, it one, it, it's representative of Virginia, touches multiple sports. Uh, we've represented 22 individual sports throughout our history, and that would probably be more if we didn't lump track and field as one. So 22 individual sports, uh, 23 of those 37 colleges that I mentioned have been represented with induction into the hall at some point. And so it, it's a very diverse group uh, that hopefully is selecting a diverse group of inductees as well. But nominations are submitted year round to be considered for the next class, though, they need to be in by September 1st. And then once a nomination is submitted, it has a five year lifespan. And if it doesn't get selected in those five years, it expires, but it can easily be renominated to start that five year timeline again. Fantastic insight. How about a, uh, an inductee of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame? that had the biggest, um, you know, I don't want to call it pop and circumstance, but the biggest hoopla surrounding him or her, either attendance or coverage or attention, uh, all the above, Will. So, you know, it, it's funny because it, it'll probably be a name that that doesn't necessarily, it, it won't be a name you expect. Yes, you know, last year we had Ryan Zimmerman and D'Angelo Hall, two great athletes from Virginia. They went to Virginia colleges and then they had great professional success not too far from here up in up in the Washington DC area. But a few years ago, uh, Coach Sonny Allen, the legendary Sonny Allen, uh, who spent 10 years at Old Dominion University, he uh, it was a posthumous honor for him as well. He had passed away a year prior to being selected for the induction. But the family was so moved by the by his selection to the hall that they helped bring almost 75 people to the event. And so we, we dubbed them Allen's Army. 
And, you know, it, it's funny, those those are the ones that you just kind of, that they, they come in off the radar, but but then they bring the people because it is such a meaningful moment to, to their family. Last year, Sean Moore, I think he brought the entire city of Martinsville <laughs> <laughs> with him to Virginia Beach. Jerry can vouch for That's that. That's true, yeah. I think the entire city of Martinsville was there. Bob Rattans from Roanoke College had 50 people, some of them former teammates on the Roanoke Lacrosse, some of them just friends. Uh, Bob is the owner of Mac and Bob's, so they're just supporters of his business that came all the way from Roanoke and Salem to support his induction. So, you know, yes, the Heath Millers of the world, the the Ryan Zimmermans, you know, they, they draw the, the attention from the media standpoint, but sometimes it's people that you might not think that are actually bringing uh, the crowd. And, and from an events, uh, event planning standpoint, we love people, we love butts and seats. How about the uh, time that goes into this, Will, for you and the staff? How long have you guys been planning? What's the the workload, and what's the uh, how does it intensify as we get closer to showtime? Yeah, that that's a great question. It's it's pretty much a year round uh, planning procedure. I, but I will say, following the induction, we usually take a, a couple months to focus on some other events that we have. But then once we get to that September 1st uh, deadline for nominations, that's when we really start to dial it back in. We have charitable golf tournaments, one in, in a, at Wintergreen, actually, in June, and then we have one in Virginia Beach here in September. But once we get past that, we really get into induction mode. Uh, our committees will start meeting in September. The Honors Court meets the first week of November. And in between the Honors Court vote and the announcement, which I typically like to do the Monday after Thanksgiving, it's on me to get in touch with the inductees who are selected, but also make sure that they can attend the events in April. Because, you know, to use the buzzword of the day, NIL, name, image, and likeness, if we put your name, image, and likeness on a flyer, people are going to expect you to be there. And so we want to make sure that if we have nine people going in, we do our best to have all nine of those people there, if they can be there. Um, we do have a deferral process. Uh, D'Angelo Hall, for instance, was actually selected as part of the class of 2020. So I made the phone call to D'Angelo in November 2019, but because he was working for the NFL Network at the time, the induction conflicted with the NFL draft, so he wouldn't be able to get off. Um, now, the 2020 induction was ended up canceled, pushed, canceled, pushed, but D'Angelo ended up going in in class of 2023 because that was the date that ended up working for him. So sometimes there are things that go on behind the scenes that the only people who know are me, the inductee, and the honors court. Uh, but once we get into, once we make that class announcement at the end of November, it's really at that point, how do we stay in the public consciousness for the next five months? Because you have the announcement at the end of November and you have our events at, towards the end of April. And we want to make sure that people are talking about the hall. We want to make sure that they're learning about our inductees. You know, we, last year, for instance, we know that Jerry is a multiple time winner of. Uh, the Virginia Sports Writer of the Year, but we really tried to highlight through social media and through other uh, uh, media outlets a lot of the other work that he did. Um, you know, we talked a lot about his golf. We use our platform to talk about what the inductees have done beyond, you know, just kind of the, the headline uh, awards and recognitions. And so over that five-month period, we just continue to stay in the public consciousness to hopefully drive more interests, more engagement, um, you know, more ticket sales, more sponsorships. But then once we get to that month, the induction month, it's all event planning mode. It's seating charts. It's, it's getting hotel rooms situated. It's, it's, it's all sorts of follow-ups and just hounding sponsors. Send us your names, send us your attendee names, but it, it's a fun process. I mean, it's, I would be lying if I said it wasn't stressful. But, you know, we have a pretty good we have a pretty good group in place that that helps us put all of this together. And uh, this year, the only wrinkle is because it's our first time in Henrico, everything is new to us. Whereas when it's in Virginia Beach, I know A through Z. You know, I keep getting stuck on about, you know, RSTUV right now. <laughs> so so <laughs> it'll all come together. That's I, I keep saying control the controllables. And as long as you control what you can control. Yeah, everything will turn out all right. How do you want to see the uh, the brand, Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, and and your efforts um, and the uh, recognition? What what are some of the goals? How do you want to see it evolve as you move forward? Um, you know, you're a goal oriented guy. We all are here on this talk show, and you guys are doing a hell of a job here. But what's on the short list for taking it to the next level? 
So that, that's another great question. And for those who don't know, uh, the hall used to have a, a large scale physical museum presence in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, we were founded in Portsmouth back in the, we, the idea was, the idea for a hall of fame was, was first broached in the late sixties. The first class was inducted in 1972. Uh, but from that point through 2017, we had a physical presence. It started small, 2000 square feet, grew to 5,000, 10,000. And then ultimately the hall of fame and museum, which was 32,000 square feet in downtown Portsmouth, multiple reasons, uh, relationships and support began to dry up. Uh, so the museum was no longer feasible, but the brand, the board of directors at the time in 2017 understood that the brand of the Hall of Fame was much bigger than four walls and a roof. And so that's actually where I came on. I, I came on, you know, I don't like to say because the museum closed, but, but that's, that's, when I, that's when my story with the Hall started. And so we really started to do more events. Uh, we started to create more community initiatives around sports. Um, our core values, we revamped them about a year ago. They're recognition, impact, and integrity. Recognition is the induction. Recognition are the exhibits. Uh, recognition is how we highlight our inductees and tell their story. Celebrating sports in Virginia. But impact, to me, is probably one of the most important ones because while we honor the best of the best, what are we doing to provide access, opportunity, highlight the benefits of sports participation at the youth level? So we've increased our, our community initiatives. We've increased our scholarships. We created a sports and mental wellness uh, initiative here in Hampton Roads. With, and I want to see those continue to grow. I don't, not just those two initiatives, but I want to start adding more to that. But the biggest thing to me is the idea is we're not necessarily going back to a museum, but the exhibits do still play a very big role in what we do. So the question that I broached to my board probably right around um, – you know, during the pandemic, as we had some time to think was, if we're the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, what have we done to really justify our role as the official Hall of Fame for Virginia? What incentive, what outreach have we done outside of Hampton Roads? And the answer was not much to that point. So we came up with the idea that instead of going back to a large scale museum, let's break the state into regions and figure out how we can tap into each one of these regions. We know Hampton Roads. We've been in Hampton Roads for years. But as much as we love our Hampton, as much as Hampton Roads people love the Hampton Roads inductees, so does Central Virginia. So does Southwest Virginia. So does Northern Virginia. So we have to find ways to, to take the hall to them. And luckily, we got our first partner to help us do that in Central Virginia with the Henrico Sports and Entertainment Authority. I mentioned we're hosting this year's events at the Sports and Events Center. Well, we also now have a physical exhibit presence there that is that is heavily focused on the inductees from central virginia so the counties from central virginia go from about new kent out through charlottesville so much of the exhibit presence that you see there is going to be focused on central virginia inductees i would love to see that replicated in southwest virginia maybe even south side northern virginia and then next thing you know you have a statewide network of exhibits that's celebrating the inductees where they're from and I, I don't want, I never want to say that an inductee is more important in this place or that place, but they're more important in their hometowns. They're more important with the schools that, that they attended. And so we just want to really find ways to continue to make those connections. And especially in a venue like the Sports and Events Center, that's a sports crowd that's coming in there. Whether they're coming in for a tournament, whether they're coming in to attend an event, they have an interest in sports. And now they might also be learning something that oh, I didn't know Ralph Sampson was from Harrisonburg. I didn't know Moses Malone was from Petersburg. So they're learning about the hall, and hopefully maybe they take that next step to learn more about us as an organization. So really creating a statewide approach is, is the long-term goal. And, and I say long-term because it, it took us a couple years to get this going with Henrico County, but I'm hoping that now people are seeing it more as instead of an idea, they actually see it now as an activation, and that's the most important thing. I think it's genius. I think it's absolutely deep genius because your inductees become ambassadors and evangelists for the Hall of Fame. They each have their own micro following um, across the Commonwealth, across the region, across the country. And as the inductees get attention from the Hall of Fame, that's going to only trickle, trickle over to what you guys are doing. I think it's a fantastic plan. I'll throw this to you. We are literally doing a show with you now, Will, um, that's broadcasted uh, on all social platforms, 
all podcasting platforms, and folks in a handful of states are watching you and, and Hootie and I on the program. How does technology, digital, and social media come into your efforts with raising recognition for the brand profile that is the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame? It's massive. And uh, I'll, I'll start that off with, you know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So we're not, I, I, <laughs> yes, we do a, a decent job of fundraising, but we're, we don't have the biggest staff in the world. Uh, in fact, we have a very small staff. You know, where our resources are limited. So what we do, I always say, let's do as much as we can with as little as we can, and then we'll find a way to, to hopefully add to that. So social media, especially in my time, has been a huge asset to us because it allows us to engage with people where they are, as opposed to when the museum was open, it was always come to us, come to us. And, and which there's nothing wrong with that because that's the approach of a building. You have to get people in the door. But we, our first step to do that was, okay, let's look at our social media. How can we utilize this to engage our audience? Well, we created our own podcast platform, the Hall Call Podcast. It started out as just audio. It's now transitioned to video and audio. And what that does is, if we, our most recent episode was with Chris Long, incoming inductee. You don't have to be in person at an event to engage with this content. You can go watch the content, which I'm biased, but I thought it was a great interview. Chris is a, Chris is a, great, a great person to talk to. But you create content for people you create initiatives for people and and that shows them that you care about them as opposed to when you're always saying come to us it it, it's, it t tends to be a one-way conversation we've i mentioned we increased our scholarship awards our scholarship awards are open to all seniors attending a high school in virginia two of this year's recipients were from carroll county and galax county which is about five hours west of virginia beach so the reach for that is growing. Our nominations over the last five years have increased from 40 to over 140. And with that, the, the, the scholarship awards have increased as well. So we're really utilizing the digital mediums to tell our story. Sometimes it's as simple as we post something about today's an inductee's birthday. As simple as that, but it puts the Hall of Fame, it keeps us in the conversation on social media so that our followers and our supporters know that it's not always just about, hey, buy a ticket to an event. Um, you know, hey, are you interested in a sponsorship? No, we want to tell you stories about the inductees. And, you know, you see, you see fun engagement like, oh, I didn't realize my birthday was the same day as, as you know, inductee XYZ. And so you just got to keep finding those ways through the digital mediums that are available to you to, to make a difference. And, and we love it. We love being able to share our story the stories of our inductees, the story of the hall with as many people as possible. Well, I'll tell you what, Will, we appreciate your time. Um, we wish you the best of luck on Saturday. Um, I have no doubt it's going to go off uh, flawlessly, and it's going to be a night and weekend to remember. Uh, we're grateful for, for the perspective. We look forward to future interviews, and it sounds like my, my esteemed colleague here, Hootie, is going to be in attendance this weekend. Gonna do my best, and uh, before you go, I, if you want to plug your uh, golf event at Wintergreen, uh, in case you're looking for people to fill up your your field, uh, go ahead and, and, and give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really appreciate that. I know you've played in it, and you have the invite as always to play. But yeah, Thursday, June thirteenth, we we host our Central Virginia Golf Tournament at Stony Creek at Wintergreen. There's Plenty of information on our website. It's our Central Virginia Golf Tournament. It's Our presenting sponsor is Blue Ridge Bell out in Waynesboro. They've been a great partner of ours for many, many years. And really, it's this This was one of the first things that we did to start kind of creating that, that presence out there. And we get a lot of colleges and universities that play. We have a, lot, a decent amount of inductees that come out and play. So it's really a fun day, you know, as long as the weather is great. And again, control the controllables. I can't control the weather, so... As, as long as we get everything else in place, it, it's, it's turned out to be a good tournament. But it's Thursday, June 13th, Stony Creek at Wintergreen. It's a, it's a heck of a day. It's tons of fun. And uh, I'd love to see some new faces out there uh, as we continue to grow the hall throughout the state. Fantastic. Thank you, Will Driscoll. We appreciate your time. See you, brother. Thank you. 
All right, absolutely. Will Driscoll, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we got a two shot right now. Judah's going to come on screen and, and, and adjust the computer and Skype. Uh, fantastic interview right there through a fantastic guy doing a lot of hard work, Cody Ratcliffe. Absolutely. Um, again, I, I, I can't tell you how valuable he has been to the Hall and, uh, and growing its presence in the state of Virginia. And um, I'm very appreciative. I know um, everybody who's uh, involved is, feels the same way about the work he's done. Um, guys, uh, thank you to Will Driscoll for joining us and many of you tuning in for the breaking news that happened right, below, right before the uh, Jerry and Jerry show launched or started this morning. Ryan Dunn enters the NBA draft. Hootie Ratcliffe, where do you want to begin? Well, I can't say that I'm surprised. Uh, and it, it, could be, um, it could be that he'll go in full force and, and, and take his chances and see what happens. He ate he still could uh, end up being a first-round draft choice, particularly uh, now that he's uh, entered the draft and will, I'm sure will be invited to the Combine and some other uh, events to where he can show general managers and scouts and coaches his uh, value. And, again, he also... I, I don't know if he's uh, what what the situation is, but you know, uh, it could be like Reese Bigman, where he puts his toes in the water to to see what kind of reaction he gets from those experts in the field as to whether he will be a first rounder or not. Multiple platforms reporting that Ryan Dunn all in and will not maintain any college el eligibility. Well, if that's the case, yeah, then that is, that settles it. Uh, so uh, then that, that means he's gone. And, uh, I, I, again, I'm not surprised. Um, certainly uh, talking to some scouts that I know and to some college coaches I know, he has – rare abilities and rare um, physical skill that you can't coach. It's just uh, an incredible uh, leaping ability, rebounding, block sh shot ability, reaction time, uh, reach, wingspan, timing. Um, all those things are, are gifts from God, and certainly he comes from an athletic family. His brother's a major league pitcher I think for the still with the Cincinnati Reds and has been uh, certainly had a great influence on Ryan and, and trying to help him deal with all the things that have come at him the past year and a half so um, I, again I, I think he needs to work on his offensive end of the game and I'm sure he will because uh, having talked to some scouts, they, they will draft off potential knowing that he is a rare talent on the defensive end of the floor in the rebounding, and they feel like their coaching staffs are good enough to make him a better offensive player. So uh, it sounds like he believes that he will be a first-round pick, which is guaranteed money and big money. So... Uh, I wish him the best. Me I, too. I, th I think he uh, he's a quality person. I, I've, I've enjoyed knowing him the past couple of years, and he's just a quality human being. Comes from a great family, and uh, one of my favorite stories about him is when uh, Virginia offered him a scholarship, and he committed to Virginia. And then Tony Bennett realized, wow, you know. We don't have a scholarship to give him. And so he he had the unfortunate task of calling Ryan and his family and telling them that, you know, we, I'm sorry, but we don't have a scholarship for you. And uh, Ryan Dunn wanted to play for Tony Bennett and play at Virginia so badly that he and his family discussed it and called Tony back and said, would it be okay if he walks on the first year and we pay his his own way? That's how badly he wanted to come and, and play at Virginia. So uh, that's a rare 
quality in, in athletes these days you don't see very often. Uh, Virginia basketball fans, it's bittersweet news. As, as, as folks that follow this team closely, we're excited for the potential for Ryan Dunn as an NBA pro with the comparisons to DeAndre Hunter. Uh, six foot nine with a seven two wingspan, a man who can jump out of the gym, explosive ability, shot blocking ability, defensive ability, certainly has to refine the jump shot. I look at this roster, we got no front court returning players. You got Groves gone, you got Miner gone, you got Leon Bond in the transfer portal, yeah. you got Ryan Dunn now heading to the NBA draft. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, this is putting significant pressure on this Virginia coaching staff to hit the transfer portal hard, aggressively, quickly. They have front court players return. I mean, maybe can we call Tane Murray a front court player um, at small forward? That maybe would, that would probably be a stretch. That'd be a stretch. The, uh, the, I guess the good news is that they have the Robinson kid who's 6'10", who redshirted last year and has been spent a year in the system and practicing. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I imagine he'll work hard this summer knowing he has opportunities to play. And then there's 6'9", um, uh, the Kofi kid from Washington, the Seattle, Washington area who – a lot of the Pac-12 schools really wanted, and it was kind of a shock that he committed to Virginia. So he's a physical presence. He's a, a player who can face the basket and get the job done. He's, he, he will add some physicality. Uh, they're working hard in the portal to bring in at least one more player. Now this opens up Clearly a scholarship. Clearly, Yeah. Um, Joshua Jefferson, who was a starting 6'8 forward for St. Mary's out in California. Uh, he's a sophomore. Uh, visited this past weekend. He has two more visits lined up to Iowa State and TCU and canceled a visit to VCU while he was here. So um, Virginia is one of three schools that he's considering. Uh he, he's a high-level contributor, a lockdown defender, uh, had some decent offensive numbers, uh, was a star in St. Mary's close win over Gonzaga in early February. He had 16 points, 11 rebounds, and four assists in that game. Um, so he, he's solid. Uh, and then they're going to get a visit this Thursday and Friday from a uh, new kid, Toby O'Connor, 6'8", uh, kid from Illinois, Chicago, uh, a school that I, I don't know a lot about, but he's a grad transfer, seven-foot wingspan with massive hands, <coughs> uh, average 11 points, seven rebounds, and two blocks per game was all Missouri Valley Conference all defensive team this past season. He's being courted by UCLA, Wisconsin, Florida State, Clemson, Arkansas, West Virginia, and a handful of others. So uh, two candidates to come in and fill that slot where Ryan Dunn has been a staple the past season. Um, this is this is this is pretty significant news, viewers and listeners. Um, Ryan Dunn entering the NBA draft. Y you look at a basketball team that is now returning Isaac McNeely. Right. I mean, you got a point guard, Reese Beekman. He's not going to come back, although he has a COVID year. Um, you got McNeely at two. Your three is, you know, to be determined, maybe right. you see a Gertrude, maybe you see McNeely play three with Bliss heading in uh, the backcourt, maybe Gertrude some kind of mix in there, maybe Rhodey if he can find a jump shot. Your four and five have transferred. Um, you, you, you do have the uh, Buchanan coming back that's going to clearly get some big time minutes now uh, in the front court. I mean, from my standpoint, you're the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, you're the pro here. From my standpoint, this really puts uh, significant pressure on the coaching staff with the portal. This is a question I have for you. Did this catch the coaching staff off guard, Ryan Dunn turning pro? 
I, I would guess probably not. You I, think I, no? I think Tony and them expected him to leave. The reason it's I asked that is... too much money on the table. I right. Think. The reason I asked that is because there has not been a transfer portal commitment. Yeah, and, and it's not because they're not trying. Yeah. Because um, the deeper we get, the more the talent comes off the table. Right. But, you know, we, we have to also remember that guys are entering the portal every day. Uh, I, I check Twitter probably... 30 or 40 times a day throughout the day and night. And uh, there's hardly an hour goes by that somebody doesn't enter the transfer portal, sometimes multiple players. So they're coming in fast and furious from everywhere, including programs like Kentucky and Southern Cal and Arkansas, uh, whose coaches are leaving and opening the door for more guys to, to exit their programs. So there's more – more guys flooding the market, so to speak. Uh, we see some. I've seen a bunch of ACC players this week um, jump into the portal as well. So I, I think there's a lot of guys out there that could fill that void. It's just uh, it, it's coming at these coaches in waves, and I'm sure they're working daily with. I don't know what kind of um, support staff they have in terms of. I know they have a couple of guys who are in charge of recruiting and player development and research and all that stuff. So I'm sure they're working their fannies off trying to keep up with with who's available and who might fit Virginia's style of play and who could fit academically, who will fit NIL-wise. There's a lot of things to consider and who they can get on campus for a visit. And uh, – this past week was the first uh, uh, – the Jefferson kid was the first guy who has visited thus far. Uh, uh, Connie will be the second. Now, there was another guy who was supposed to visit this past weekend, the, the Harvard point guard who uh, apparently is going to go to Georgetown instead. Uh, rumors of a lot of NIL money thrown his way. Um so I, I think Virginia is just now delving seriously into the process of trying to get some of these guys on campus. I think they've been trying to weed out who's available and who might fit. Uh, Ryan Dunn, if you're just tuning in, guys, has, has turned pro. And he, according to um, a couple of outlets, is not looking to uh, consider uh, a return to college, which leads – you to believe that an agent sighting is on the horizon or he's just saying, look, I, I see the potential writing on the wall. Do you, do well, you, you can, you can have, you can still, and come these back. days you can uh, have an agent and still be still eligible. return. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think how the season finished had anything to do with Ryan Dunn turning pro or was the writing always on the wall? I think as long as he was going to be a first-round choice, he was probably going to be gone because, again, uh, that's a lot of money that you've got to weigh. Uh, the opportunity might not be there the following year if you have a, a, a bad year or if you get injured. Um, so, again, uh, a lot of these NBA teams draft off potential. So I, I felt like that as long as he was still going to be considered a first-round pick, not necessarily a lottery pick, but a first-round pick, that he was probably going to go. Even though I still think another year would uh, make him a, a more complete player, but obviously uh, in his mind that's, that's not the important thing right now. Uh, the Who's guys have two incoming first years signed in the class of 2024. If Reese Beekman leaves, Coach Bennett and his staff have three open scholarships. Um, right. the, the team clearly needs a veteran point guard and a post player that can score the basketball. Um, so time will tell. We have a lot of potential on the roster with guys like Christian Bliss but from an experience standpoint, your most experienced player is Isaac McNeely, and you're returning 
I guess Rody saw some starters minutes mm -hmm. and Buchanan saw some starters minutes. Right. But really you're returning one uh, true starter that played from start to finish this past campaign. Yeah, and a bunch of other guys who had some starts and played some serious minutes. Um, Rody, uh, Tane Murray came on strong down the stretch. I, I think he's going to be a better player. Uh, I think Buchanan will bulk up physically in the offseason and, and be more of a force there than he was. Uh, Gertrude, we've only begun to tap into how great he can possibly be. Do you think Ryan, Do you think Leon Bond transfers if he knows the Ryan Dunn news? Yeah, I think he was going to go anyway. You think he was? Because he was kind of a tweener in between a two-guards height but a front court player's game? Yeah, I think he was kind of stuck in, the, in that mold because uh, he just didn't have a jump shot. Didn't and, have a jump shot. And it was, uh, that was tough for him. Uh, whether these new guys that are 6'8 that are coming in, apparently they have somewhat of a jump shot. I don't know about a Connie, but I know the Jefferson kid apparently does. Uh, I think both of them are, have... Uh, made a decent amount of three-point shots. So I, I think should they get either one of those two guys, it'll be an upgrade in, in terms of of bond. Um, certainly neither one of those guys are the athlete that Ryan Dunn is, but uh, they do have uh, p potential uh, more offensive firepower than, than Dunn or Bond provided. Um, other transfer news, Justin Taylor heads to Harrisonburg, uh, where JMU, he's going to, yeah. yeah, JMU, the Syracuse, uh, wing two guard transferring, uh, from the orange to the Dukes. He's a Charlottesville boy, uh, dot the I's and cross the T's on anything else basketball related. What you're following before we get to Saturday spring game. Yeah. The, the Malik Brown kid from Syracuse from Culpepper apparently is from what we heard is going to visit Duke this weekend. So I don't know if, if Virginia is on his radar or not. We haven't heard much out of his camp. Uh, but he's certainly a guy that I would think Virginia would be interested in if there's any interest from his part. But uh, other than that, I, I know that they have reached out to uh, probably 30 players in the portal. Uh, they're looking at a, a lot of different guards and a lot of forwards um, in hopes of shoring up the roster. And I, I think it'll probably heat up um, starting this weekend and, and until the end of the uh, till the portal closes. Um, basketball news, guys, on the brain. Football certainly front and center with the spring game. You're going to be at Scott Stadium. Calandria takes a boatload of players to his house in Florida. We got uh, two quarterbacks with experience, and Tony Elliott's got more expectations, or I should say a little bit of pressure, than perhaps any year he's had in Charlottesville so far. Yeah, it was kind of a cool story uh, that uh, evolved yesterday in a, a Zoom conference with the, Tony Musket and Anthony Calandria and Taylor Lamb, the quarterback's coach. And uh, I guess Sedarian Harris, one of the wide receivers, had spilled the beans on that trip in a previous Zoom that uh, Calandria had taken uh, 13 teammates down to St. Pete, his hometown, and they uh, arranged for a, a, like an 18-room bed and, bed and breakfast, or Airbnb, I guess, um, where they hung out for a week. Tony Elliott gave them a week off during spring break. And instead of just going to the beach and play some football uh, and, and goofing off, yeah, it was his, it was more about football. They they went down on a, in a in a bonding experience. They 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 stayed at the house in St. Pete. Uh, they got up every morning and drove to Tampa uh, and worked out at a at an indoor facility there. Um, from 8 a.m. until 1 p.m., then drove back to St. Pete and enjoyed the day as uh, college youngsters would do. Um, 
they did everything together, uh, worked out together, ate together, um, hung out together the entire week. And it was only skilled players. It was a bunch of the wide receivers, a couple of running backs and a tight end. And um, uh, it sounds like that these guys had a blast. And, and that's, that's an incredible way to build chemistry. It's something unique to our time, I think, in terms of college players. I know NFL guys have done that. Forever. For, forever. Yeah. But, uh, but this is certainly new in the day of NIL. <laughs> what are you going to be watching in the spring game? How much you take from the spring game? And which positions are you most focused on in the spring game? I don't know how much you can take from a spring game. I've probably been to a million of them during my career. Because uh, coaches are going to be a little vanilla in most cases. Although last year, Virginia threw it all over the lot. And we first saw Calandria. We, we saw how bold he was. We didn't really expect him to play that much as a true freshman. But we did see the uh, arm and the potential and the brashness of his play in the spring game. Uh, you, can, you can see certain things. We saw, I, I spotted last year that Malik Washington was going to be an incredible addition to the team because not only was he able to get open all the time, uh, he, he didn't have his, he wasn't involved that much in the return game, but the couple of returns he had, I saw uh, the potential there for him to make an impact on, on the football team, and certainly he did. Um, I, I, we'll be looking at the, both the quarterbacks to see, see how they've developed. Uh, originally, we didn't think that Tony Musket was going to be available in the spring because of the shoulder surgery he had in the off season, but he overcame uh, all those issues with incredible work in his rehab, and, and he said a lot of prayers to get back and participated fully, I think, in the entire spring, got equal reps to Calandria. Uh, the big emphasis during the spring from that standpoint was for both quarterbacks to get better, to develop and uh, to get Calandria out of some of the bad habits that he has, but not take away his gunslinger mentality. You don't want to take that away from a quarterback because it's a gift. Absolutely. As long as he can keep it under some kind of control and make better decisions. So it'll be interesting to see how both those guys have developed this spring. It'll be interesting to see the new wide receivers. Um, Chris Tyree, Andre Green, some of the others, the freshman, Cam Courtney, uh, how they fit into the system, uh, where Kobe Pace has, is as a running back. They're a little thin, I think, at the running back spot. Um, I don't know that we'll see much with the offensive line because a lot of those guys, I think, missed the spring with recovering from surgeries and, and stuff. Um same on the defense. I don't, I don't know how many of those guys will be available. But, uh, you know, you can pick up little nuances here and there in the spring game, but I don't, I don't think you can get masses, uh, a massive amount of, of impactful information during a spring game. Totally agree. This is one of the items I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be watching uh, fan attendance. Uh, well, that, that's usually about the same. <laughs> right. Why I'm going to watch that is whether we're going to see any kind of um, excitement for the year to come or, or if there's apathy setting in because of performance over the last handful of years. Um, Saturday in Charlottesville in spring, there's a ton of stuff to do. Yes. Um, there's a ton of spring sports. Obviously, all the things we like to do, breweries, wineries, hikes, restaurants. This weekend is the Tom Tom Festival in the downtown mall. So I'm curious to see what attendance is going to be like on Saturday at Scott Stadium. Uh, we're going to follow that closely. We're also talking baseball across the spring sports um, as our eyes shift to perennial powers, Hootie Ratcliffe. Yeah, the baseball team's coming off a great weekend in Louisville. Uh, I think they host Georgia Tech this weekend. I'm not sure. Um, 
Georgia Tech's always a form formidable opponent, and uh, uh, they're going to be playing a lot of meaningful series uh, over the next month uh, in, in, in a quest to get back to Omaha. And uh, right now, uh, Brian O'Connor has one of the most explosive offenses in college baseball. They're, they're number one in the country in so many different offensive categories and a fun team to watch. If you like run production and, and action, um, Disharoon Park is the place to be. Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three-game series um, against the Ramblin' Wreck. Will Driscoll was nice. You got a, a busy weekend yourself, my friend. Yeah, I, I feel obligated to try to make it back to this year's ceremony. They, they like uh, former inductees to attend if they can, and the, the fact that it's in Henrico, which is pretty close uh, this side of Richmond, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm not real familiar with that area, but uh, I, I'm going to try to do the double dip and go to the spring game and, and attend the uh, induction ceremony if I can. Um, it's just a, a lot of great people there, and you don't know who you're going to run into. Uh, ran into so many people <laughs> last year that I didn't expect to see, in, including uh, an old friend of mine, one of the first people I met when I moved to Charlottesville back in the early 80s, uh, Governor Allen, George Allen, who whose law office was right behind the newspaper when I uh, – came to town and I, I was drawn to him because of his dad George Allen the Redskins uh, legendary Redskins and NFL coach and uh, I used to go over to his office and, and just sit and talk football for hours on end and uh, we became friends and remain so to this day but uh, you just never know who you're going to run into at, at the Hall of Fame ceremonies what's in the hopper on jerryratcliffe.com well, uh, certainly we'll be following the Ryan Dunn news and uh, all things transfer portal. Uh, like I said, we check on that probably 30 times a day as to what's going on and uh, heavy spring football the rest of the week. And then hopefully we'll be able to have some time to delve into uh, the rest of the spring sports from this from this weekend on. Ryan Dunn, guys, is clear. I mean, it's going viral on social media. Jerry Ratcliffe will have uh, maybe dot the I's and cross the T's on that yep. on the website. Uh, the Will Driscoll pool was fantastic, Cootie. He's just a terrific guy. guy. I yeah. mean, he's so hardworking, and he's made a huge difference in the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. I know a lot of people aren't that familiar with it. Um, I have been. Uh, I used to. Back in the day, Media General used to sponsor the golf tournament, which was at that time held in Williamsburg, and I would take... Which course? Uh, I think it was Forge Colony oh, most yeah. of the time. Uh, it might have drifted off to another course at, at some point, but I was generally at Forge Colony, and I was charged with taking some of our chief advertisers who were golfers for... Uh, a weekend trip down to that uh, event and entertain them. And uh, we would always, uh, we, it's a captain's choice golf tournament. We would, we would always, you know, uh, have the meals and the social events. But um, the golf was always fun because you had your foursome, uh, which was always a bunch of great guys. And we were always joined by a, Hall of Famer in our group. So we would have a fivesome. And I remember playing one round with Lefty Drizel, which was one of the most memorable days on the golf course I've ever spent. Uh, and uh, Ralph Sampson, uh, just seeing him swing a golf club uh, with a, like a 74-inch driver or something like that. Uh, but uh, uh, And some other Hall of Famers, um, uh, one of the guys whose name escapes me, who, uh, Ken Willard, who played, was a star running back for North Carolina from Richmond, is in the Hall of Fame. And he was in our group. He played for the 49ers. Um, and uh, that particular year, Frank Quell, the Virginia legendary running back, was one of our advertisers I took. 
and it, it amazed me to see Quail, who most people look up to as a superstar in Virginia football history, how he was idolizing uh, Ken Willard, who was one of his heroes when he was growing up, and to be able to play golf with him in that setting just made his day. It was, special. It was special, and Willard uh, at that point uh, looked like he could still step out and play in the NFL. He still lifted weights and uh, was a massive dude. I mean, it was unbelievable, but... Um, uh, it's just uh, if if you have if you've never been to a Hall of Fame ceremony, uh, this would be a great year to go. There's tickets, you can, like you said, you can still get them through tomorrow. Just to see some of the locals go in and and some of the other people, it's uh, it's worth your time to go down and see it. And if you can't do that, then you know support their golf tournament over at Wintergreen. Who knows? what uh, Hall of Famer you might be linked up with in your captain's choice for some. There it is. Hootie Ratcliffe, guys. He set up the interview with Will Driscoll, the executive director of the sports, Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. His website, jerryratcliffe.com. We're on it every day to get all Virginia sports news, knowledge, and information. Hootie, excellent show. Um, Judah Wickower, thank you for running the technology. He's Especially the Especially with the interview via Skype, flawlessly done, my friend. The I Love Seville show is up in one hour and eight minutes at 12.30. So long, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hootie, that was excellent. Skype. Uh